Hello everyone, I'm here today with Charlotte Fox Webber and we're talking about desire and needs because she's written a book called What We Need. She's a psychotherapist on the Weldon site and I'm very happy to see her here today. Um, I wanted to start by asking what led you to want to write about desire? Quite a restless person and I've had a lot of therapy myself starting when I was six years old. Um, I had heart surgery as a child and I felt anxious and worried and I was kind of sent to therapy ostensibly for something that would be helpful but I felt so preoccupied and agitated and the therapist just never asked me what would actually be helpful, what I might enjoy. And I feel like I spent decades waiting for a therapist to ask me what really mattered, what would kind of work for me or suit me. And I was too embarrassed to ask those questions myself. And I think that's often the case that we're kind of waiting for someone to prompt us and insist that we consider what really matters. And then that can be too much pressure, of course, but there's this kind of awkwardness around desire and it's not as talked about as as you would expect in a way, given how central it is, given that it's a kind of defining feature of human beings. Uh, how do you de define desires or wants? You know, must they be long standing? I did not get overly carried away with the, the kind of distinction between wants desires, fantasies, longings, yearnings, pinings. I mean, some people make a real point of separating each thing, but I, I just didn't, I didn't want to have to stick to categories in that way. So I, I think, I think desires can be short lived. They can be long term. It, it's anything in that sense. How, how can therapy help us with our desires? Therapy can be very interrogating and confrontational and intimate with what's really going on internally. And I think that is incredibly rare given how we're socialized to kind of dodge and conceal and duck away from admitting how we really feel most of the time. And we do it in therapy too. We're kind of coy and cover up and, and play certain games. But I think, I think that therapy can be brutally honest and curious in a way that other spaces just can't offer. I mean, that's not to say that therapy is the only way to deal with desire, but I think it's it's just more possible to uncensor ourselves there. Do you think it takes time to work out what your desires are? Sometimes, and I think it takes a kind of presence of mind and a, a feeling of ease so that curiosity is possible. I, I think we get in our own way and get very caught up in people pleasing and all the, I mean, the kind of shoulds and the responsibilities of life are more distracting. I think time can go either way. How do you think it helps? What do you mean time as in how long we desire something or? As in the time it takes to figure out what you want. So people will sometimes kind of obsess over an issue and and think about what they want and not know what they want. And it may not be in an atmosphere that allows for that kind of curiosity. I think there's usually a kind of panic that sets in or an overthinking that isn't really looking at whatever it is. So I think clearing the way and kind of making making it possible to just see whatever is there, even if it's horrifying and unrealistic. So if a, if somebody was coming to a therapist to talk about something they wanted that perhaps they didn't want to want, or they felt was wrong that they wanted it, would it generally, would part of the therapy generally be trying to understand why, how that came about in their life? So talking about their childhood or further back in their life? I think, yes. I mean, we we look at where we're from in therapy. That's what we do. And we kind of 
retrace our steps and try to understand, but I think we can get very caught up with causality and wanting to kind of make sense of it all for why something is the way it is. And it's usually for a number of reasons, but I think it's also about dealing with longings that cannot necessarily be fulfilled. That's a huge part of the work. And people are terrified of discovering that they want something that's un realistic of course but i think go on well i was just going to say you know there are lots of things that one might desire that one's never going to have you know you're to be to be beautiful and wealthy and and powerful and and you know to have a longer life these things we can't necessarily have them how I, how how does therapy help you in in understanding that I'm, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I'm in favor of kind of acknowledging limitations and actually sometimes giving up hope. I think that hope can be really dangerous when it's misplaced and it's kind of waiting for a miracle. And we think that it's good to be hopeful and to kind of hold space for what might happen, but actually we get very fixated on one outcome that that may never be possible. And I think walking away from things and realizing that a situation is hopeless can be such a relief. And realizing that you you wanna do something in your life that will never happen or what you're looking for is completely unreasonable. Uh, would you say that a lot of therapists see people who are nursing a broken heart, that there's a desire that they had and it didn't work out a relationship uh do you think that's a common thing that people want to talk to a therapist about i mean i don't know that everyone wants to talk about it but isn't it everyone i don't you think we're all heartbroken in some way how would talking to a therapist help you if you were heartbroken i think allowing allowing for someone to witness something that feels unbearable. And people sometimes come to therapy and they have one issue that they that they think they want to address and it's actually standing in for something else. And what isn't said can be more interesting in a way and more relevant, but it can be so unbearable and terrifying that it's hard to get there. So I think what brings someone to therapy is not necessarily what what holds someone in therapy and and in that case does it eventually come out or are therapists on the lookout for this kind of decoy subject i mean i think i think it's kind to say difficult things as a therapist so i try to name what i think i may be picking up on but i also think that of course therapists can be overly expertly and and it's a kind of uncertain, curious, collaborative process, but I think that holding space for discovery and allowing for someone to say something that's just unbearable, again, it's kind of allowing for the despair in a way. So saying that you're heartbroken, saying that you're lonely, saying that you feel unloved, it's, it's staggering and it's also consoling most of the time. Mm -hmm. So to be heard is is a, a lot of what therapy can be used for. Holding space and looking at difficulties and saying things, I mean, offering a different point of view and possibility as well. Saying things that that may not always be completely accurate, but are but are also a kind of different way through. And I think that we get very singular in sticking to a path even if it's unspoken, we can hold on to stories about life and it can be really transformative, as obvious as it sounds, just to see a situation from a different angle and can shed light on something and make an adjustment. I think we often overcomplicate how out of reach and impossible a fantasy may be. So we think that life has to go a certain way, but we also think that it's kind of endlessly impossible to do anything different.
differently. I realize that's a kind of generalization, but we we get in our own way, basically. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, do, w- would you say that um, men and women are different around desires and and uh, and their their belief in in their their ability to reach them or their their the chances that they will will actually be able to pull off something amazing that they want i think that women are historically socialized to be the object of desire not the desiring subject and we are less comfortable kind of taking things for ourselves historically but i i do also think it's changing but those roots are there in most cultures and kind of being wanted and being being needless as well there's something embarrassing and greedy seeming about desiring too much for a lot of women and you know in the world that we live in now in the world of of social media and 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 sort of mass marketing of of everything it being very difficult to resist um being you know the goal of a lot of uh you know expensive uh, digital marketing etc um do you find that people um that desires have changed i think culturally yes and there's mimetic desire and consumption and we are a weird combination a lot of the time of kind of taking in too much and filling ourselves without getting fulfillment. But I think that another problem societally is that we expect fulfillment. So we expect satisfaction, we expect enoughness. And of course, we're not gonna get enough of something. I mean, I I don't know where that demand came from, but. I mean, we can look at its origins, but there's this kind of insistence that we will one day have enough or that we're deprived of enoughness when of course we are. And of course life falls short and we fall short and we are so emphatic about having fulfillment and getting satisfaction from work, from relationships, from everything, having meaning kind of come to us. I mean, what about sort of traditional things that people used to want, which were, you know, I guess uh, a little bit more, more modest, you know, kind of perhaps a family, perhaps children, a place to live in that they didn't have to move from all the time. Do you think that um, the power of those things is a little bit less now that it seems that extraordinary wealth and um, and, you know, kind of adoration by millions can happen to some people uh, without being born royalty or without being the sort of ruler of a country. Um, Do you think that's changed the way that we feel about enoughness, as you say? Can it all seem like nothing and you should just get that for beginners? I think that we have lots of possibilities and options and there are there are more scenarios for how life should be. So we've stretched it and it's more expansive by definition. But I think that we we don't necessarily think about our values in a kind of ongoing way. I, I sound very judgmental actually to say that, but values not in a moralistic sense, but in the sense of what matters to me at this time in my life. I'm like just thinking for ourselves about what feels important. And if we don't do that, then how how are we gonna kind of discover anything fresh and exciting and interesting if we're not if we're not paying attention? So And I you think, think of yeah, sorry, keep going. I'm sorry. Even if we have the option, I we're not necessarily emotionally free. Well, a lot of what happens in life is not of our volition. Things just happen in life, don't they? And have a big effect on us. Mm-hmm. You know, our health or other people's actions, etc. cetera. Um, and I guess 
you know, when you're younger, you probably think more about what you desire and need. And then people get sort of tied up in everyday life. I find that it's really upsetting how we can stop thinking about these these issues once we're past young adulthood, like past our early 30s. How many people contemplate and consider and feel that they can redefine themselves and recast themselves in an ongoing way? I mean, hopefully lots, but I think we can get very set in our ways and very kind of automated where we forget we forget that we're allowed to change mm. and then we become intolerant with ourselves but we're not we're not necessarily trusting that we can recast ourselves that fresh experience is very helpful so often it's about having some kind of new encounter just new new moment of consciousness and therapy can be that experience for a lot of people and it can it can be subtle but profound for for opening up some kind of space for growth and it, it doesn't have to be dramatic but i think i think we often make it so extreme for what it would take to get ourselves out of a rut that I, knowing where to begin like people will ask all the time how to figure out what they want and and what they can do to get it like what is the kind of trick or the complicated system and mm. i think it's just starting somewhere and and having that motion having that kind of astonishment with your own consciousness mm. so having having a real conversation in therapy can can really begin something what what would you say is 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 the biggest misconception about therapy that you will be made to look at difficult painful things and you will just have to stay there and it won't get any better like i think maybe that's just my own fear but i think that there is some kind of avoidance of ourselves like that we will find out something and there won't be anything that we can possibly do so why bother to face it and we're frightened mm -hmm. and i think we're also usually frightened of the things that we most desire i mean desire and fear are, are interchangeable at times can you so, can you explain that a bit more what you mean by that if you really want something then it will also be terrifying in some way because you might you might not get that something you might get something and lose it it might be dangerous you you might want something that is completely taboo and off limits or unavailable and there's vulnerability and and actual risk in pursuing something that you want but i think there's also danger and kind of not pursuing something you want so i think that actually holding space for fear can help pull out desire if you if you don't know where to begin like think about what frustrates you and think about what you're afraid of and that will lead to you to what you want i think both are cover-ups for some underlying longing but it's easier to to hold back or to critique and complain than to kind of go there immediately so we'd rather complain about our job and complain about our line manager and feel blocked and kind of hindered than say i really want more power in the workplace i feel really determined to take out my colleague and get my boss's job i mean it's it's hard to say those things and they're not always pretty but we then complain for a long time and kind of hold back from ourselves mm. and i think that the fear factor like if you if you really want love and you've never felt deeply loved it's terrifying to admit that that's what you want so we can just shut down and can go the other way mm. thanks charlotte that was great 
Uh, and just want to remind you all that I've been talking to Charlotte Fox Webber and her book is called What We Want. Thank you. Thank you.